All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And we're here to talk about sutras. And so tonight, we are back in the middle-length discourses of the Buddha. We're in the Majjhima Nikaya. We're moving on to the very next sutta. So tonight, we're going to be talking about sutta number 44. And this one is the Chula Vedila Sutta, the little sutra of questions and answers. So last week and the week before that and the week before that, so the last three weeks, we were working on sutta number 43, which is the Maha Vedila Sutta, the large question and answers. And this is the little one. And you might remember from a while ago, that we're in a portion of the Majjhima Nikaya where the suttas are grouped together in pairs. And these are the pairs of littles and bigs in that way. And so let's look into this. So this is going to be another sutta like last one where there's no Buddha. The Buddha does appear in this one, though. He does appear at the very end to sort of verify the information but otherwise, this is one of those suttas where the primary spokesperson, the primary deliverer of the information, is not the Buddha. And tonight, what's really interesting is that the primary deliverer of the sutta, the teacher tonight, is a nun, is a bhikshuni named Dhamma Dina. And that name actually is a very interesting name. So let me give you a little backstory on this sutta and, and the, the people involved. So this sutta, a lot like last time, like I said, this is a sutta where a lay person has some questions, some questions about the Dharma. And basically they, and this is a, a lay householder, named uh, Visaka, a male lay householder. But what's really interesting about this story is that Visaka and Damadina, the nun, they used to be married. They're, they were a couple. And the backstory about this couple is that Visaka who was this really wealthy, I think he was a merchant, really wealthy householder, he started to get interested in the Dharma. He started to go see the Buddha. And the story is, is that he basically started to spend all of his time hanging out with the Buddha, learning the Dharma. And pretty soon, eventually, his wife was like, what about me? <laughs> and so then she said, I want to get enlightened. <laughs> can I can I get enlightened too? And within the world of Buddhism, the answer is, of course. And so that's when the, the, the wife renounced and became a nun, left, left her, her husband, left the household life, and went and became a nun. Now, she did this with her kind of husband's full support. In fact, there's kind of like a backstory that you can find where he, th he threw her a, a kind of a party, a going away party in her uh, joining the monastery. And what's really interesting about this story between these two is that Visaka remains a householder I don't know, maybe he was still, you know, uh, involved in his wealth or whatever it was, but he remained a householder. And the story is, is that he eventually achieved the state of a non-returner. And you might be aware of this, that in the early Buddhist tradition, there's these four fruits, these four attainments, right? A stream enterer, a once returner, meaning only one one more rebirth, a non-returner, which means you're actually never going to be reborn, 
in the human realm. You'll finish out all of your practice in some kind of heavenly realm or the fourth attainment of being an arhat. So Visaka, the husband, achieved the state of a non-returner. But the wife, who becomes a nun, she eventually becomes an arhat. So the first thing that's kind of interesting about this backstory is that, well, actually, I would say for me personally, the first interesting thing about this backstory is the absolute equality that Buddhism has in terms of male and female devotees, that there is no uh, cap on the achievements that can be attained by men or women in that way. So the first thing that's interesting about this story is it presents that. But the next really interesting thing about this story is that the wife becoming an arhat, the husband in our sutta tonight is coming to ask his, his former wife, the nun, for advice and clarification. And so, you know, as most of you know, you know, before I kind of became officially a teacher of Buddhism, I was a kind of a professor of religion taught in universities, I taught religious studies. And, you know, the world of religion is, is a tricky world when it comes to inequality, unequal access, right? And so the Buddhist tradition is always kind of a standout. It's always kind of an interesting member of the world of uh, world religions because of its really egalitarian attitude in that way. But then I guess what I kind of want to get at is that this is what I want to say. Let me, let me stop beating around the bush. There's little things that do come up within the world of Buddhism. For example, in the Theravada tradition, so only one of the traditions and it's the kind of older, more conservative form of Buddhism. There is a rule, there is a rule where it says basically that the nuns have to walk behind the monks, that the monks have this kind of priority in that way. And there's some like rules about bowing, right? Like who bows to who, when, and all of that. So some formality stuff. And it's easy to sort of like notice those instances of inequality. It's easy to kind of latch on to those and be like, you know, why do the nuns have to walk behind the, the monks and da, 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 da. But, and I think that that's all worthy of critique. I really do. But what I think is unfortunate is when a sutra like this isn't even spoken about, where it's not even like, equality. It's actually pointing to how the, the wife has become a more advanced teacher. And so the husband is going to go talk to her. This is, in the world of religion, this is radical. Like this kind of easy or easeful switching in that way of like, oh, okay, we'll go see the bhikshuni. So I want to stress how like important that is. Again, in terms of comparing it to other religions where it's not often that a woman can be a voice of authority is what I'm getting at. So let's kind of respect this sutra tonight where not only is the woman a voice of authority, but it's also not a big deal that she's the voice of authority. It's just the, the way it is. So, but I haven't mentioned her name yet. So the husband, the, the, the householder who's coming with the questions is named Visaka, but his wife, her Dharma name, so not her real name, and I couldn't find what her, her kind of uh, birth name was, but in the sutta, she's called Dhammadina. And what that, as far as I could tell, what that, um, 
what that word means so that you know the first part. The first part is our dhamma, which is the Pali pronunciation of dharma, right? The dharma. And dina is, it's kind of it, it's a kind, it's a form of the word dana, like a giving, but it's the specific kind of giving that I guess the um the English word would be betrothed. Old, it's an old word, I know, but it's this kind of like the giving away of the bride, right? They use that language in English, the the father gives the bride away. Well, the giving away of the bride is this dina. But what that name means, what Dhamma Dina means, is basically married to the Dharma. And when you know the backstory of this couple getting divorced, basically, so that they could both pursue their spiritual interests, she takes on this Dharma name that is like married to the game, right? Married to the Dharma. So thought that was interesting. So that's our uh, couple that are going to be chatting. Um, yeah, let's just dive in. I will let you know a little bit more about where this takes place. But the opening paragraph is, of course, thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Rajgaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel's sanctuary. Then the lay follower Visaka went to the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina, and after paying homage to her, he sat down to one side and asked her. And the first thing he asks about is identity. But really quickly, I do want to tell you that this sutta takes place in a in a place called the Squirrel Sanctuary, which is a, a bamboo grove. And some of my favorite sutras take place in the bamboo, or sorry, in the squirrel sanctuary. Um, it does seem to have been both a nunnery and a place for monks, but you often hear the squirrel sanctuary when there's nuns involved. So from my little historical deduction, the squirrel sanctuary does seem to have been a kind of a hot spot for the, the bhikshunis in that way. Um, yeah. And so I just wanted to note that, that it's kind of a particular vihara. It's a particular monastery or temple, whatever you want to call it. That's associated with the nuns often. So let's get to the, the Dhamma though. Let's get to the Dharma. So this is, like I said, this is a lot like the sutra from the last couple of weeks where it's about clarifying the definitions of certain things. But I do want to remind you, though, that even though this sutra is going to sound very, mm, I guess, like encyclopedic, where it's just like the definitions of things, the sutra has a progression just like the last one did, where it's it's going to take us on a kind of Dharma journey in that way. So the first stop on our journey, Visaka says to Dhammadina, Lady, Sakkaya, Sakkaya, it is said. What is, what is called Sakkaya? by the Blessed One. So what does the Buddha mean when he talks about the Sakkaya, or in Sanskrit, the Satkaya? So this is a tricky word. It basically literally means true body. So Sat, like Satya, is truth, and Kaya, the body. So the satkaya or the sakkaya, it's kind of a technical term. And it's being translated here by Bhikkhu Bodhi as identity. And while I think that that's a, like an, a fine, maybe even excellent translation, 
I want us to go a little deeper on what the kind of original word is, but I might just come back to identity in that way. But when we're talking or when the question is, what's the true body? Like, what's the sakaya? What we want to be thinking about, like, if we are, like, visaka here, if we're visaka, the question is about, you know, we have this kind of idea or this question, this existential question about, like, who are you? Like, really? Like, what is your true being? And as you know, if you've been coming to Dharma doors, we often talk about the self and we talk about trying to locate the self. In fact, we're going to be doing a, a little bit of that tonight. But the idea here is, is that if you've come to Dharma doors, you've heard me talk about, well, it's this question of, are you your hands? And you know, you might say yes, you might say no, but then I would ask you, well, what happens if you were to lose your hands? Are you still you? And if the answer is, well, yeah, I just don't have hands anymore. What that shows us is that in your thinking, you're not your hands. In other words, you're, you're being, let's use the language of being for right now. Your being doesn't necessarily require hands. So what does your being necessarily require? What is your true body in that sense? So my point is, is that the this technical word, sakkaya, the true body, it's sort of like the true self in that way. But this is going to get tricky though. So, and in other words, what I want us to understand before we hear what the answer is, usually when we're talking about the sakkaya, like the true body in a different tradition, non-Buddhist tradition, we would be talking about like the soul maybe and like the your soul is your real body and it's sort of like trapped maybe in the physical body so your real body isn't this physical body it's like a maybe an ethereal body or a spiritual body something like that you know and you could get you could you know in a spiritual uh in a sp spiritual realm or whatever, you could talk about a light body or, you know, these different kinds of bodies that aren't the physical body. And the point is, is in a lot of spiritual traditions, that would be your, your true body. Don't get hung up on your appearances. Don't get hung up on the material flesh. You should, you should identify your true body. So, a lot of spiritual traditions, a lot of meditative yoga traditions in India, we're all talking about the real true body. So Visaka comes to Dhammadina and says, when the Buddha says Sakkaya, what does he mean? And our bhikkhuni, our nun, Dhammadina says, friend Visaka. These five aggregates affected by clinging are called identity or the true body by the blessed one. That is material matter, material form, or the aggregate of material form affected by clinging. The aggregate of sensations affected by clinging the aggregate of perception affected by clinging, and the aggregate of consciousness affected by clinging. These five aggregates affected by clinging are called sakaya or identity by the Blessed One. 
saying, good lady. The lay follower of Visaka delighted and rejoiced in the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina's words. But then he asked her a further question. Lady, the origin of the Sakkaya, the origin of identity, the origin of identity, it is said. What is called the origin of the Sakkaya? What, what is called the origin of identity by the Blessed One? By the way, quick note. So what's kind of going on here? They're having this conversation about Sakkaya, this true body. And the first question is, what is that? The second question that I just read is, and where does it come from? What is its origin? And just to let you know, we are also going to ask about its cessation. And we're going to ask about the path that leads to the cessation. And so all the Dharma heads out there would immediately recognize the formula about the Four Noble Truths, which is sort of about the, the statement, which is suffering, the origin of it, the cessation of it, and the path that leads to the cessation of it. So what I'm getting at is, is that we are actually having an interesting conversation about the Four Noble Truths, but rather than focusing on this idea of suffering, dukkha, we're focusing on this idea of the sakkaya, the true body, which has just been defined as the five aggregates affected by clinging. And of course, you know that that's the cause, that's suffering right there. The five aggregates affected by clinging is suffering. So I just want to point out how we're basically having a Four Noble Truths conversation, but focusing on a slightly different aspect. So we've just established what is the Sakkaya? It's the aggregates affected by clinging. What's the origin of that? Friend, she says. It is craving, tanha, which brings renewal of being, is accompanied by delight and lust, and delights in this and delights in that. That is, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for being, and craving for non-being. This is called the origin of identity by the Blessed One. So classic formulation, of course. A little language thing really quickly. So the five aggregates, the five skandhas, which are prone, prone to upadana. So the five aggregates that are prone to clinging, prone to this upadana. And because it's going to come up a lot tonight, I want to remind you what that means. Like the five aggregates affected by clinging or affected by upadana. So I want to remind you that one way to understand that idea of upadana, clinging, yeah, it, it means, you know, clinging, like, you know, being attached to something in that way, for sure. But I, even though it's a little kind of, um, it's a little technical, but I really like thinking about upadana as appropriation appropriating. And I say that because in English, when you appropriate something, it can be physical, meaning you can like, you can grab it and, and like take it in that way and be clinging to it. But appropriating can also sort of be a mental activity. And what I mean in particular 
about a kind of um a kind of mental appropriation well what i mean by mental appropriation it's the idea of mine not yours mine and what i'm getting at is you know like the idea of my cup mine not just a cup that i happen to be using right now but i want you to look at like examine even in your own mind but like look at that very idea of ownership the idea of mine well right there is appropriating it's a kind of a clinging but again it's not necessarily like you're holding it in your hand but you are mentally holding it as mine well that's what the buddha's talking about or that's how i understand what the buddha's talking about in terms of the five aggregates that are prone to appropriating. So the physical body, the first aggregate, is prone to grabbing on to things, literally physically in that way. But I want you to notice that the other aggregates are also prone to owning. And what I want you to think about in particular is a uh, like a sensation. So the second aggregate, a sensation like um, you stub your toe and it hurts. There's a way that we can own the pain. My, it's mine. It's happening to me. Versus there being a sensation. But not owning it. Same way with perception, same day with conditioning, same way with, with consciousness. My point is, is that the Buddha seems to have identified that the five aggregates that make up a sentient being, all five of them are prone to appropriating. It's what they're kind of in the business of doing all the time. So that's the being prone or or affected by, I guess the language is, affected by clinging. But then there's this idea of, well, what, where does all that come from? What's the origin of that? And the answer is tanha. Tanha is craving. And basically kind of what we want to recognize is that Craving is when you don't have it, but you want it. Upadana, appropriation, is when you've gotten it and then you're not letting go of it. So we want to kind of notice the relationship here between the craving and the clinging. And, in, and indeed, a big part of Dharma studies is noticing that relationship between craving and clinging. Notice that you easily let go of things that you don't crave in that way. But if you crave it, it usually leads to a clinging or appropriating in that way. And of course, tanha, as we know, is the cause of dukkha. That is the formula of the Four Noble Truths, that suffering and then the cause of suffering is this tanha. Now let's quickly talk about these though. So the answer is that the origin of this sakaya, the origin of these aggregates that affected by clinging, is craving, which brings renewal of being and is accompanied with delight and lust and delights in this and delights in that. That is craving, tanha, a thirst, for sensual pleasures, a craving for being, and a craving for not being. So those three right there, you know, is, are important to look at. And 
in particular, we will just want to spend a moment looking at the craving for being and craving for not being. There's a few different ways to interpret this. When it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to something delightful or something pleasing in that way, we crave its being. <laughs> we, we crave it to be the case. But when that annoying mosquito is flying around, I crave it's not existing. <laughs> and I might even facilitate that non-existing, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I might even bring it to non-existence quickly in order to avoid getting you know, bitten by the mosquito. So you can interpret or you can understand craving for existence and craving for not existing as being about stuff out there. But you can also understand that as craving for existence, meaning, you know, just desperately not wanting to die, or the opposite, being very depressed and craving non-existence. In Buddhism, both of those are problematic. And so there's this more neutral place of not desperately craving life, but also not desperately craving to not be either. Just very equanimous, equal, not desperate, not thirsty, not craving. That's the idea. Questions about those first two questions, either this idea of the true body being the aggregates or craving being the origin of all of that. Besides the addition of this Sakaya idea, it shouldn't, none of this should really be new information. Oh, and by the way, there, we're, we're shortly going to get to a part where the true body is explained a little clearer. So I'm kind of waiting for that. All right. Lady, the cessation of identity, so the cessation of the Sakaya, the cessation of the Sakaya, it is said. What is that? What does the Buddha mean when he says the cessation of identity or the cessation of the Sakaya? Friend Visakka. It is the remainderless fading away and cessation, the giving up, relinquishing, letting go and rejecting of that very same craving. This is called the cessation of identity by the Blessed One. Classic third noble truth, right? Second noble truth is that suffering is being caused by craving. And so the third double truth is simple, no craving, no suffering. Well, here it's the same idea, but no craving, no sakaya. Actually, even before we go any further, let me, let me explain. In the next section, the sakaya, this idea of the sakaya, it's going to be equated with the idea of a self. And so we are talking about the kind of the constructed sense of a self or a constructed sense of an I. And Visaka's first question is, what is that? What is that constructed sense of I? Is it the Atman? Is it the soul? Is it this? Is it that? No, it's this. It's the five aggregates. And then what brings that constructed sense of self about? Craving, what makes that delusional constructed sense of self go away? Not craving. And then, of course, the fourth part of this. Lady, the way leading to the cessation of identity. The way leading to the cessation of identity, it is said. What is called the way leading to the cessation of identity by the Blessed One? 
friend Visakka. It is just this noble eightfold path. That is, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. We're going to go into the Eightfold Path in another section, so we'll save it for that. But this is an interesting question, and this is where this is not just like a quick review of the Four Noble Truths in that way. So Visaka has a very interesting question for Damadina. He says, Lady, is that upadana? Is that appropriating? Is that clinging? the same as the five aggregates affected by clinging? Or is the clinging something apart from the five aggregates affected by clinging? It's an interesting question. Is the clinging one thing and the five aggregates another thing? Well, friend, that clinging is neither the same as these five aggregates affected by clinging, nor is clinging something apart from the five aggregates affected by clinging. It is the desire and attraction in regard to the five aggregates affected by clinging that is the clinging there. So we, we could spend a lot of time on this but this particular formulation of not identical but not different is a very kind of Buddhist way of thinking and answering things. And so what we want to notice is, is that regarding this clinging, as it pertains to the five aggregates, the sentient being in that way, the idea is, is that you will never, ever, ever find clinging somewhere where there's not five aggregates. So it is not that the clinging is separate from the aggregates because you will never find it just floating, you know, just an instance of clinging floating out there in space, but no aggregates there doing the clinging. So you'll never find them separate. So they're not distinct, but the clinging is not the same as them. And the, the I would been struggling with like how I would explain this, but the simplest way that I can express it to you is that it's basically saying that you can have the five aggregates without clinging. And so that shows that it's not the same, exact same as the aggregates. Because if they were the same, then you would always have clinging with the aggregates. They would always be synonymous. So that's kind of the basic way to interpret her, her answer there, that they're not the same, but they're not different either in that sense. All right, questions about this first part regarding, yeah, no. Uh, very often there's the phrase, the five ag aggregates subject to clinging. And yes. so you can't, so you can't have clinging without the five aggregates, right? So the uh, clinging arises within the five aggregates. I don't know if that's the right language, but something like that. But but you could have the five aggregates without clinging. Yes. Right? Yes. And there's a way in which all of this would be futile if not. Yes. Like if we could not get rid of that clinging, then all this would be for naught. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's move to the next one. So the next section is actually, it's similar, but it's a it's an even kind of deeper level. So uh, Visaka, the next question is, lady, how does the Sakkaya Drishti come to be? How does the view of the Sakkaya come to be? So the Adrishti. 
Here, friend Visaka, an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, who has no regard for true people and are unskilled and undisciplined in their dharma, such a person as that regards material form as self or self as possessed of material form or they regard material form as in self or self as in material form. So that's the first aggregate. They mistake the first aggregate for being the at, uh, Atman. Or they regard sensation as self or perception as self or habits, conditioning as self, or what often the case, or they regard consciousness as the self. So what I want to do here with this section, so if you happen to have the Wisdom Publication Edition, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi has an awesome footnote, footnote 462 there, and I want to share with you the, the details of that footnote. So we've we've talked about this before on Dharma Doors. It's this um, kind of this fourfold view of a self. And what it is, is and it, they just expressed it, but it's this idea that, you know, what is the self? You know, who are you? This is what we were talking about at the beginning of, of tonight's class. Are you your hands? Well, the idea is, is that there's these four possibilities for the self. And I, I want to explain that footnote. So the first of these, and we're going to work with the first aggregate. So I want to work with the aggregate of material form. So your, your physical body. Forget about sensations, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. This is just the idea of the physical body. And regarding the physical body and this idea of the self, there's this fourfold possibility. The first one is articulated as that an, an untaught, ordinary, regular, deluded person regards the material body as self. And the example that, well, it's the example the Buddha gives in a different sutra, but it's what Bhikkhu Bodhi tells us about in that footnote. The way to think about that first one they say is like a candle and the candle flame. And it's the idea that the self is in physical form, like the way the, the candle light is in the candle. And so that's the idea of thinking that this physical body is the self, like they're, they're the one and the same. But then the second one, or they regard the self as possessed of material form. And the language of possessed is a little tricky there. But the example is that it's like the shadow of a tree. There's a relationship between the two. No tree, no shadow. But the shadow isn't the tree, exactly. So there's a way of thinking of the self as, it's like a shadow of your physical self in a way. And so no physical body, no shadow, no self, but the self in this view isn't exactly the same as the physical body, like in the first one. It's like an effect of it, if you will. The third possibility is that, or they regard material form as in self. Again, the language here is tricky, but the example that is given is a really good one. And this one is, it's the idea of the 
the smell or the scent of a flower. And it's the idea that the smell of a flower is, it's in, it's in the flower, right? It, like the smell of a flower doesn't come from over here. It's like, it's in the flower, but it's not exactly the same thing as the flower. So that's another way of thinking of the self is that it's kind of like the, a smell that's in there but isn't exactly the same as the physical body. And then the fourth possibility that they regard the self in material form, they say that's like a jewel in a treasure box where the jewel is the self and it's in the box of the body in that way. So those are these four possibilities for finding a self in that way or the nature of the self. But I want to remind you that these are four delusional ways of thinking, but they're just four possible delusional ways of thinking in that sense. And so I want to remind you that the idea is, is that an untaught ordinary person that couldn't care less about the Dharma, they think that they're either the same as their body or they're, an aspect of their body or they are somehow in their body like a smell or in their body like a jewel. Or, and we don't need to go through all these, but I actually think it's worth reflecting on or forget about the physical body and just take the sensory body. Like just your sensations. So, you know, take stock of the temperature of the room so you, you can feel if it's warm or cool or whatever. So that's a, a bodily sensation. And then there's visual sensations, auditory, olfactory. So there's this kind of sensory body. It's related to the physical body, but it's not the physical body. It's like a sensory body. And you could, an unenlightened, deluded person could think that the self is like the same as the sensory body or that it's a, an aspect of the sensory body or that it's in that sensory body like a perfume or it's in the sensory body like a jewel in a box. Or you could think of your, whatever you're perceiving right now, like and then in that act of perception, you could be mistakenly thinking that the self is in, like is the same as that perceiving you're doing, or it's an effect of that perceiving, or it's in the perceiving, or like in the perceiving. Or what we could do is, the idea could be that I am my habits. So I'm not the physical body. I'm not the sensory body. I'm not even what's being perceived, but the, the habitual processing, the way information is habitually processed, that's me. Like I'm in the habits or I'm the same as the habits or I'm an effect of the habits or, but it's all about those habits. That's the real me. Or we come to the fifth aggregate of consciousness and we could either think that I am the consciousness, like I am this thinking, or I'm like a shadow of this thinking, or I'm like a perfume of this thinking, or I'm somehow mysteriously in this thinking. All of those, of course, are not the case in that sense, but that's what we have been told. So how does identity view or how does the drishti of identity come to be? People don't respect the Dharma or they don't know the Dharma and they think the self is the aggregates. Well, lady, 
How does identity view, how does the view of the Sakkaya not come to be? Here, friend Visakka, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones and is skilled in disciplined in their dharma, who has regard for true people and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma, such a person does not regard material form as the self or the self as an effect of that material form or material form as in self or self as in material form. They do not regard sensation as self. They do not regard perception as self. They do not regard habits, conditioning, samskara as self. And they do not regard consciousness as self. That's how the view of identity doesn't come to be. On that note, because I haven't said it for a while, I feel like I haven't said this one for a while. And this is where I want to address translating the Sakaya, the true body idea. I want to address translating that as identity. So the idea that I haven't said for a while that I want to mention is let's talk about identity. So you've, many of you have heard this from me a lot, but you know, there's a lot of different ways that we could identify. We could identify, let's see, one of the classic ways that we human beings identify is we identify with our name, right? Like when people are like, hey, Michael, I'm like, hey, what? <laughs> Talking to me? <laughs> so identifying with one's name, right? But are you your name? Can't you change your name? Can't you go by a nickname? So is the name like an essential inherent part of who you are? And if you look at it, what you realize is, oh, like, yeah, I could identify as Michael, but I could go get my name changed and identify with a different name. Okay. Another thing people do is identify with their sex or gender. But you could go change your sex or gender, which shows that that is not fixed in that way. And you could identify with this or that, but that's another way in which we identify. You could also identify with your occupation. This is another classic one, especially in the kind of Western, especially in America, where it's basically like, hi, nice to meet you. What do you do? Right? In America, we often, the very first question is often, what do you do? Meaning, I need to identify you. So what's your occupation? Because in this country, we tend to identify people by their occupation. And people tend to identify themselves by their occupation. I would even do it. I would say I'm a teacher. And there I would go identifying with my occupation. But I could get a different occupation, right? Which shows that that particular occupation is not fixed or inherent to my being in that sense. Um, along with name, uh, first name, we can often identify with family, which is our last name, right? So that's another one. So I'm, I'm Michael, my name, but I'm also of the Owens clan people, and I'm a teacher, and I might identify as a male teacher. Ooh, nationality. That's another thing that we often identify with is this idea of where we're from or where we were born. But that's another thing that I could identify now as, say, American. But what if I move to Europe? What if I start living in, in Europe for a while? 
and I start identifying as an expatriate or as a European. So there are many, 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 many ways to construct identity based upon all of these different things from name, uh, sex and gender, nationality, occupation, family, take your pick, just a bunch of different ways. The one thing that I haven't said for a while or I haven't mentioned, and I just, this gives me the opportunity. I know that we tend to be in a situation where it's like, well, I identify as Michael, but I could change my name and identify as that. Again, I could change occupation. I could change all of those things, right? But what would it be? What would it be like to not identify? What would it be like to not identify with your name or occupation or body or anything actually? Just try it out. Like just try to feel what that would be like to not identify. That's what's kind of, or that's how I understand what's being spoken about here in terms of this, how does identity view, how does the Sakkaya Drishti not come to be? <laughs> By not identifying. Not identifying with the body of form or sensations or perception or conditioning or consciousness or job or occupation or any of these things. And it's a very, very subtle state of mind because if you even like really start to entertain the notion you can begin to recognize how you know or i'm speaking just from personal experience or personal just what i would go through right now i know how to not identify as say that name but i kind of quickly need to be identifying with a different name then like i know how to give up one but can I stay in a state of unidentifiedness? <laughs> it's an exercise to just notice the mind's tendency. It's that the aggregate subject to clinging. But it's about noticing the mind that then needs or wants something to identify. It doesn't need to be a job. It doesn't need to be ethnicity. It doesn't need to be anything. But there's a way in which it needs to be something. And this is just, again, this is a, a vipassana, this is a contemplation to look around and notice how you identify. And then just ask yourself, what if I didn't do that? What would they, that be like? So, yeah, Maria. Okay, there we go. Um, this just um, made me think of really quickly um, how liberating it has been. The you know a few times in my life where I've been someplace where I was kind of anonymous, like nobody know knew who I was, or like I didn't have an identity, and it's. Um, it's really fun and it's kind of liberating to do that sometimes. I I was happy to hear liberation come out of your mouth because I would I would like everybody to hear this message as liberating, you know, not as a, a downer in that way. So awesome. Cool. So. Let's move on to the Eightfold Path. Oh, and, and by the way, in terms of the progress here, so we've kind of stated the problem. The problem is this Sakkaya, this um, identity view in that way. And we've just established that it would be a good thing to not do that, right? To not identify with the aggregates in that sense. 
So it kind of begs the question now at this point of like, okay, cool. <laughs> I got it. How would I do that? If, if I was interested in this liberated state of not identifying in that way, how would I do that? Well, that leads us to the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, so, lady, what is the Noble Eightfold Path? Uh, Visaka asks. Why? Well, what I really wanted to say is, friend, I already told you. But we're to understand this is probably stitched together from parts, so we will let it slide. She says, friend Visaka, it's just this Noble Eightfold Path that is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Lady, and now this is an interesting question, is the Noble Eightfold Path conditioned or unconditioned? Is it samskrita or asamskrita? Friend Visaka, the Noble Eightfold Path is conditioned. It's samskrita. Friend Visaka, or sorry, lady, are the three aspects of the teaching. It says aggregates, but we need to know that we're just, that term's being used in a different way. But the references to the three divisions of the teaching, morality, meditation, and wisdom. So the question is, lady, are the three divisions of the teaching included in the Noble Eightfold Path? Or is the Noble Eightfold Path included in the three divisions of the teaching? And the answer is that the three divisions of the teaching are not included in the Noble Eightfold Path, friend Visaka, but the Noble Eightfold Path is included by the three divisions of the teaching. How is that? Right speech, right action, and right livelihood, these states are included in the aspect of virtue or morality. Right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, these states are included in the aspect of samadhi, of concentration. And right view and right intention, the first two on the Eightfold Path, these states are included in the division of pranya, or wisdom. Pretty classic division there, but... So... Any questions about the Noble Eightfold Path? Right speech, right action, right livelihood, intention, thought, any of these. I, I don't want this to turn into like a, you know, an Eightfold Path Dharma talk. So I'm not even going to go through them. But if anybody has questions about them, happy to discuss. Cool. Yep. And that's just a very classic, um, you know, it's a very classic Buddhist thing to do to take a list like the Eightfold Path and divide it into subgroups and things like that. That happens a lot. So now that the Eightfold Path has been established in that way, we now move on to a question regarding meditation, regarding samadhi. So Visaka asks, lady, what is samadhi? What is concentration? What is the basis of samadhi? What is the equipment for samadhi? What is the development of samadhi? Unification of mind, friend Visaka, that's samadhi. The four foundations of mindfulness are the basis for samadhi. The four right efforts, so the four kinds of right striving are the equipment for samadhi and the repetition, development and cultivation of these same states is the development of samadhi therein. So the key expression there is going to be this uh, ekyachita graha, 
I believe it's called, this unification of mind, this um, one single-mindedness in that way. So that was the answer for, like, what is samadhi? Well, Damadina, the bhikshuni, she defines samadhi as this single pointedness or single mindedness, unification of mind. We've talked about this before. I've mentioned it before. Like everything, you know, this is open to interpretation, but I'll give you kind of, again, my kind of quick summary of that idea. I think I even gave it maybe even last week or the week before, but the way I understand this idea of single pointed mind or unification of mind, for me in my meditation practice, it begins by noticing the mind being divided in time. And this is just a process I go through, but it's noticing my mind being split between like, um, thinking in the past, so like having, you know, ideas about what has already happened, anticipating the future, like what's going to happen, and then, of course, what is happening. So I notice that my mind can be split that way, and then I notice my mind can be split in terms of me focusing on, you know, inside of my body, but also part of my mind is outside my body, focus on what I'm experiencing, what's outside. So there's kind of a division in terms of inside, outside, the division between time that I mentioned. And then within that, like within all those divisions, the mind can be divided even more, like fractured into many, many foci you know, many, many ideas going on. So I think of the process of shamatha, basic Buddhist meditation, as basically letting go of or jettisoning, say, future in the past. Just be kind of here. And then instead of being really focused on external things and internal things, you can use the, what do they call it? The, the basis of samadhi is the four foundations of mindfulness. So the basis, you can bring your attention totally to your body. Just for, forget about the external world for a second. So now you're really present in time and you're really presently focusing on just the body. Then if you really follow the four foundations of mindfulness, your focus is going to get even more focused in that way, in terms of really focusing on aspects of the body and then the sensations and then states of mind and then dharmas. And through that process, the mind becomes more and more unified less fractured, less divided, until eventually there is this total focus and the mind is unified. It's not split or divided at all. And that's where you usually hear samadhi as defined as a non-dual experience, where there's no longer a me and an it. There's just sort of, in a way, unity. And so that's how I kind of roughly understand this idea of the unification of mind is samadhi. The basis for that, as she said, is the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness. The equipment that you're going to need in to, to pull this heist of the mind off, the equipment that you're going to need are the four right efforts. And if you don't know about the four right efforts real quick, right? It's all about being very aware of nasty things like anger and good things like, say, loving kindness, for example. 
And the right, the four right efforts are about not allowing nasty stuff to arise. If it has arisen, though, you really try to kind of not feed the flame. You really just try to observe it. So if something nasty, if an unwholesome dharma arises, you just kind of want to let it be and not feed it. And if you don't have any unwholesome dharmas, you want to keep it that way. And then when it comes to wholesome dharmas, if you've got a little bit of loving kindness, you want to tend to it and increase it and get it to grow. And if you happen to notice that you don't have any wholesome dharmas arising, you don't have any loving kindness, well, then you want to work on bringing that about. And those are the four right efforts regarding wholesome and unwholesome dharmas. That's our equipment that we use. And then you keep doing that. So the repetition, development, and cultivation of everything we just talked about, yeah, that's where you can find samadhi. So, question about samadhi. All right. So we have just enough time then for the next section, which I was hoping that we would get to this one because this one has like some really interesting information. So the next section is on samskara, the habits or the conditioning. It's that fourth aggregate that we've been talking about. And Visakka's question, the very first question is, how many kinds of samskara are there? How many different kinds of habits are there or conditioning? There are three forms of samskara friend visakka there's bodily samskara there's verbal samskara and there's mental samskara but lady what is a bodily habit what is a verbal habit what is a mental habit in breathing and out breathing friend visakka that's a bodily samskara, a bodily habit. You do not think about breathing. It just happens. Interestingly, vitarka and vichaya, applied thought and sustained thought, are verbal samskara. Hold off on that one. She's going she's gonna, to uh, answer that. And then samya and vedana, so perception and sensation, are mental samskara. But, but lady, Visaka says, but lady, why are in-breathing and out-breathing bodily samskara? Why are vitarka and vichaya verbal samskara? And why are samya and vedana mental samskara? Friend Visakka, in breathing and out breathing are bodily. These are states bound up with the body. That's why in breathing and out breathing are bodily habits or samskara. First, one applies thought and sustains thought. And subsequently, one breaks out in speech. That's why applied thought and sustained thought are the verbal samskara. Perception and sensation, samya and vedana, are mental. These are states bound up with the mind. That's why perception and vedana are mental samskara. All right. So let's talk about habits. So, you know, the first thing, if, if, if anybody out there, which I think all of you know this, but, you know, samskara can be translated a lot of different ways. Formations, which is what they're going with here. Formations, volitional formations. Um, 
I don't know. There's a lot of different translations. It's one of the trickiest ones to translate. I prefer the the language of conditioning because I basically, I, I want people to be thinking about behavioral conditioning, like B.F. Skinner and that type of psychological understanding that it's so much of our behavior is conditioned, is habitual like ringing the bell and salivating, like Pavlovian dogs. Uh, so the Buddha recognized that a lot, if not almost the entirety of our behavior is conditioned. It, the world is just a bunch of bells, different kinds of bells that have us salivating and moving around in all kinds of ways. So that's the why I prefer this language of to translate it as conditioning, because if you know about behavioral conditioning, that's what they're talking about. But then this is always interesting to note that there's these three different types of conditioning and to notice that there's a lot of things like blinking and breathing. So there's a lot of stuff in the body that's just going on habitually. It's a habit. And so that's all this bodily stuff. Now, I'm often talking about verbal samskara, but I'm talking about learning to read and write and actually learning a, a language. I use that one a lot because, well, if you don't know Polish, for example, if somebody comes up to you and starts speaking to you in Polish, you're not going to understand what they're saying. And it's because you're not conditioned in that language. But if you start taking classes, start Duolingo or whatever app or whatever, and you start exposing yourself to the Polish language, you can condition your mind to associate sounds, words, right? with ideas and pretty soon you begin become so conditioned you no longer have to think about trans like right now you're conditioned in english you don't have to translate what i'm saying you just you just hear it but notice how fluid that is that you just understand what i'm saying it's conditioning though. Like it took years and years for your brain to become conditioned to be so fluid in the English language that way. So that's how I usually think of verbal conditioning. Uh, Damadina though, she did some interesting thing by saying that Vitarka and Vichaya, remember Vitarka is looking around, being on the lookout for things, and then vichaya is when you notice something. And she says that that activity is that that's what causes one to break out in speech. <laughs> and if you think about it, it's really subtle, but it, it's kind of like you do have to kind of settle on something in order to talk about it. Because if you haven't settled yet, what would you be talking about? Right. So there is a very interesting relationship between those. But of course, when it comes to samskara, we're normally thinking about mental habits, those kind of mental reactions, those, you know, the way that the mind is just operating habitually in that sense. And that's where we, what we want to think about with her answer is she says, well, regarding Mental conditioning, that's about perception and sensation, vedana. But let's remember that vedana, let's remember that the second aggregate sensation is not, it's not just the stimulation, like the the sensation. When the Buddhists are talking about Vedana, they're talking about the way that you react to 
sensations. In other words, when you have a sensation, do you want more of it because you find it pleasurable and you would like it to keep going? Or is it a painful sensation that you want to go away? So it's not just the sensation, it's your reaction to the sensation and whether you are inviting more of it or less of it. And so when it comes to that being a samskara, you know, think about, um, you know, let's say you're, um, let's say you're a little kid and, you know, somebody gives you, I don't know, what would, what would a little kid probably not really like to eat? You know, something that, something that is like, would, uh, you know, you have to acquire a taste for it. Right. And so, you know, just, I don't, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but imagining a child having a negative reaction to a food and being like spitting it out and be like, ew, that's nasty. So that's a negative reaction. But what we want to notice is the next time somebody offers the child that food, the child's going to habitually, instinctually go, ew, no. And that's a conditioning. That's a habit. So Vedana is habitual, meaning the way that you react to things is habitual. And then in terms of perception, you know, I always, I have all my various optical illusions, but we want to understand that what you're perceiving, whether it be a rabbit or a duck or, or an optical illusion, but what you're perceiving is based upon your conditioning. Somebody at some point had to show you maybe a bunny rabbit and be like, this is a bunny rabbit. This is a bunny rabbit. So that later on, when I show you that, and your mind, because remember, we're talking about mental samskara. When your mind goes, oh, look, a rabbit. That's a conditioned response. And I, I kind of use these optical illusions to show you that it's up to you what's here. It's not actually necessarily out here. So to point at the conditioning of perception and the conditioning of uh, sensations. Questions about the three types of conditioning or just conditioning in general. Yeah, Maria. Just another quick comment. Uh, in the context of Buddhism, isn't optical illusion a little redundant? <laughs> Indeed. Yes. <laughs> so since we have a few minutes left, um, and I don't want to move on to a new section, allow me to say a few more things about samskara then. So because it's such an interesting topic, like the idea of, of um, conditioning in that way, and in particular, you know, a big part of, of um, I shouldn't say a big part, but a part of Buddhist vipassana, of insight work, is sort of tracing habits like that. Like, um, what I mean is, is that, so let's say you had a negative reaction to something. You could look underneath that and try to figure out what habit caused that negative reaction. It's almost a form of doing self, um, self-analysis in terms of tracing back, triggering responses and things. And doing this kind of work of identifying the source of these kind of habits in that way. So I say that because it could be argued or it could be presented that Buddhism 
like the tradition of Buddhism, the practice of Buddhism is about getting rid of samskara. That you could make a case for that. I, I could definitely make a case for what this project of Buddhism is about, is about clearing out conditioned habitual responses. I'm not saying it is, but I'm just saying you could make an argument that that's sort of what all of this is about. It It's a big part of it. Again, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the entirety of it. You could possibly, but it's definitely a part of it that we are working on kind of getting rid of those habitual reactions. And the reason why I say this is because the language that you might be familiar with in the world of Buddhism is the language of developing a mirror-like mind. This is very common in almost all Buddhist traditions. Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana. They all use this metaphor of the mirror-like mind. And I want to share one aspect of that with you. So I'm, I'm always forgetting to bring my mirror, but imagine you have a mirror. And I want you to think about the way that a mirror reflects what's going on, right? That if you, if I had a mirror here and I held up the pencil, the mirror would <laughs> reflect the pencil, right? And what I want you to think about is in the operation of the mirror reflecting the whatever is before it. So like, oh, look, and it would present a pencil. And it's like, here's a computer mouse. And it would reflect the computer mouse. What I want you to think about is how the mirror, the mirror never ever goes, wait, 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 I wasn't done looking at that. Notice how a mirror just dynamically responds or reflects its environment in that way. Well, that's kind of this analogy for a mind without samskara. A mind that's not filtering things through the lens of past experience and judging it through past experience. Now, I want to make this really clear. I'm always saying this, but doing this, meaning clearing out samskara, it doesn't make you a zombie. <laughs> and it doesn't make it that you forgot things that you've learned. It's, it's not about that. It's about basically not, well, I could say a lot of things, but it's kind of about, well, prejudice in the sense of prejudgment and that idea that, you know, like the, like the kid who I gave them the food and they spit it out and they didn't like it. And then I, a year later, I offer it again and they go, oh, I hate that. And it's like, but you've never had this. You've never tried this. You're talking about a year ago. You're talking about that food. So notice that the child has already determined that whatever that is, is going to be nasty. Now, of course, in such a mind state as that, it probably will be nasty. But my point is, is that it's already been determined. And so a lot of clearing out of samskara is clearing away kind of like these knee-jerk reactions and a, a very clear mirror-like mind is, well, is more clear in that sense, less response, like a less reactive, I should say, in that way. All right, so that's the time. We'll have a lot more to talk about next week because we're going to keep going with this. But any questions or ideas about that last point about clearing away our habits or our conditioned behaviors? Well, good luck with that. I, I kid, I kid.
I mean, I mean it seriously, like good luck with that, but <laughs> all right, everybody, let's call it a night. Um, this is, this gets better and better. So we're going to keep going with our, um, our little, littler Vedala Sutta next week. So stay tuned for that.